Hey everybody, this is Erica, the technology nerd who likes to film stuff, and I went out and got myself a Galaxy Note 4, and over the past couple of days I've had a chance to play with it, so now I want to make kind of a first impressions video to let you know what I think of it so far. It's actually a pretty interesting phone. So my first impression of handling this device is just how much more premium that the Galaxy Note 4 feels over the Galaxy Note 3. I do have to say though, when I got the Galaxy Note 3, I thought that this felt pretty nice in the hand, but after handling this one, it feels like this phone is in a different league entirely than the Galaxy Note 3. That metal band really does make a difference. Those chamfered edges really make a difference as well. They got rid of that faux stitching along the back here, which you can see on the Galaxy Note 3. It looked kind of cool at first on the Galaxy Note 3, then kind of just looked a little bit cheap after a while. So that seamless appearance is helping it, definitely. And also, this device is quite solid and heavy feeling. It is heavier than the Galaxy Note 3. So the look of it in combination with how heavy it is does give it that premium quality that a lot of people look for. So I have to give kudos to Samsung here. Plus that 2.5D glass looks quite nice. I'm happy to see that it doesn't extend over the bezel because if it were, this would be the first thing hitting the ground, the glass, and that's never a good thing. So there is a bezel that's protecting that glass. I also like this striped appearance of the black model. This looks like a very industrial phone, a very professional phone. So I quite like it. I also like other things about the design such as how this band tapers here. You can see that it tapers at the top and also at the bottom. And of course, I do like that faux leather type feeling. There is one thing to remark though about this material is that I noticed with the Galaxy Note 3 that after a while that faux leather type coating that's on here, you can see that it comes off. You can see just the shiny plastic underneath and this dull part here that you can see is where this material is. So I'm not sure how the Galaxy Note 4 is going to hold up, but this is not so nice in appearance. Maybe because this is a very seamless design, we won't see that happening. We don't have any edge part that's sticking up. It's just nice and rounded. So that is something I will pay attention to. And I'm also happy to say that on my model, I don't see any gap. People talk about this gap gate thing where you can stick a business card or whatever into the gap. That is not a problem that's on my device. I don't see any gap that is surprising or anything that would stick out to me whatsoever. So I'm not going to dismiss what people are saying. I'm sure that this is a problem on some units, but you can see that it's not a problem on all units at least. Keep in mind though that this is the T-Mobile model. We also see that there is no T-Mobile insignia on here whatsoever. So it just looks like purely a Samsung branded phone. I think that that aids in making it look nicer as well. Nobody wants T-Mobile on the back of their phone, regardless if they support that carrier or not. Everything considered with the appearance, they do seem to be about the same thickness. There is a bit of an illusion that this is a thinner device because of those chamfered edges, but you can see that that back cover does dome downward. So when sitting on a desk, they really do appear to be about that same thickness. On the front, everything looks to be in about the same place. You've got the receiver in the same place. You've got that front-facing camera in the same place. 2 megapixel front-facing camera versus 3.7 megapixel front-facing camera. We've got the notification LED in the same place. The proximity sensor and ambient light sensor in the same place. You can see that the home button looks similar, but this one is a bit bigger. You do have that fingerprint sensor as well. Our buttons on the bottom are different though. We no longer have the menu button on the bottom, but rather we have the task switcher, but the back button is in the same place. We've got the volume rocker in the same place. This does have that nice clicky premium metal feel to it. Same thing with the position of the home button and where you can pull that back cover off of. Standard headphone jack, we've got a microphone here. You've got our infrared blaster for the TV. Now on the bottom we have the S Pen silo in the same spot. You can see that we have the speaker on the Note 3 on the bottom here. And it's graduated to being on the back cover on the Note 4. I am glad that when holding the sides I am not obstructing the speaker anymore. So I am a little bit happier about it being right here on the back. You can see that we also have two microphones on the bottom here where there's only one right here. And we've gone back down to USB 2.0 versus 3.0. And I am not missing it whatsoever, honestly. On my Mac, I was gypped out of using the features anyway. And plus I found it super annoying that I ended up having a lot of USB 3.0 cables floating around. So when I wanted to charge a device that had USB 2.0 because I have some tablets and other things floating around, it didn't fit. So it's nice to have something that's standardized. So again, not missing that at all. 
One other thing that I'm noticing right now that just bothered me to no end about the Galaxy Note 3 are these ridges here on the sides. All they did was collect goop from your fingers and other things, and it just looked grimy after a while. We don't have that at all on the Galaxy Note 4. Instead, it's a textured appearance, so those fingerprints don't really show up. Thank goodness this device just looks so much more simple and so much more clean. Behind the back covers, we've got much different looking batteries. This thin looking battery is from the Galaxy Note 4 and the Galaxy Note 3, so don't be thinking you can interchange these batteries under any circumstance. In terms of battery capacity, you can see that the Note 3 has a 3,200 milliamp hour battery versus the 3220 milliamp hour battery of the Note 4, so ever so slightly larger. I am quite pleased so far with the quick charging feature on the Galaxy Note 4. It goes something like being able to charge from 0 to 50% in just a half hour. And I think it works actually pretty well. If I am down on battery power, I know I can just plug in my device for a little bit of time and be able to go and not have any worries whatsoever. So that is a glorious feature. That's what I loved so much about the Oppo Find 7 and the Oppo Find 7A is that they charge so quickly. The battery life wasn't so good on those devices, but they did charge very fast. I'm happy to say that the battery life on the Galaxy Note 4 is pretty good. I've been getting about almost seven hours of on-screen time. I will be continuously stressing this battery, seeing how it holds up over the next few weeks, but so far I am pretty impressed. You can see underneath the back cover, they have moved the position of the SD card slot. It used to be on top of the SIM card tray. I'm happy now that the base model on the Galaxy phones is 32 gigabytes of internal storage. That's what really bothered me on the Galaxy Note 3 and all of the other Samsung phones before it, because Samsung was pretty darn stingy to have over 16 gigabytes. So finally, we have a 32 gigabyte base model and also 128 gigabyte expandable SD card slot. So that's lovely. Looking at the cameras, this is a 13 megapixel camera and on the Note 4 it is now 16 megapixels with optical image stabilization. I will be getting into that. And then we've got our heart rate sensor and also there is a UV sensor on this now so you can hold it up to the sun and see what the UV rating of the day is. So there's a lot of stuff that this phone includes. There is one stuff that this device is missing and that would be any type of waterproofing ability. When you have waterproofing, it does tend to stunt the appearance of a device a little bit, at least in Samsung's case. And also, the speaker tends to sound a little bit muffled. So I'm sure for that premium appearance, Samsung decided just to forego that. So now I want to talk about my favorite part of usability, which would be one-handed usage. And coming from the iPhone 6 Plus, the Galaxy Note 4 is quite a bit of fresh air. The reason being is that the iPhone 6 Plus does have that double tap feature to get the display to come downward so you can reach the stuff at the top, but it doesn't take into any type of consideration that I'm not able to comfortably reach across. Yes, I have heard endlessly, if you've got small hands, you don't need a big phone, yada yada yada, but well, screw that. I want to have a bigger phone, and I want to be able to use that bigger phone with one hand sometimes. And it's nice that Samsung actually takes this into account. So even with my Galaxy Note 3, there is a setting where you can be holding the phone like this. You can swipe inward and then outward really quickly and it activates this smaller display. I do have to admit that on the Galaxy Note 3, this smaller display was easier to activate. I could hold it just like I always tend to hold a phone, which is with my pinky at the bottom. And I can just swipe my finger this way and it makes the display smaller. Samsung has made a bit of a change here to where you can't hold it the way I want to anymore and just do this. It doesn't make it pop up anymore. You can see it annoyingly brings it into this flipboard section. It won't activate it. I think Samsung wanted to make some changes because maybe it was just too easy to activate if you were flipping through panels on the phone. So now you actually have to have your hand towards the middle and your thumb must meet the middle and pull outward. Then it makes it smaller. So that is a bit of a pain for me. How am I supposed to do that? I don't want to fumble finger the phone and have to choke upward to do that, to execute it. That made me upset at first until I realized that they included a new feature where you can pull outward and you've got this little sidebar that you can move around to the top, bottom, left or right. And you've got some controls here for one hand. So if you want to hold your hand in the middle of the phone, or you don't want to choke around the phone to reach the home button or to get to the recent apps or the back button, 
you have access to all that right here. So here's the recent applications. Here's your home button, back button, and look it, look what I found. You have the ability to make it smaller. So now I use this all the time because it's very easy to activate. And then it's also very easy to make it go backward once it's smaller. So this is a lovely feature. When you go outward, you can see that it hides itself. So not only does it remedy not being easy to activate this smaller screen feature, but I also have all access to everything here. I never have to worry about getting downward to something ever again. So for people with small hands, if you want a large phone, this might be your best friend. Another thing that I am actually digging is that you can take your finger from either the right or the left side and you can pull downward. You can see you've got a smaller window here, so you can just move that aside. You can resize it. And then you can get into an email, you can get into a text message, you can do whatever you need to do, and you can have five of these open at a time. And if it's in the way, you simply touch it, and you can make it smaller into these little orb thingamabobbers, and you can aesthetically place them here or there. They look very much out of the way. That was a feature that I always really loved. The thing is that it kind of existed on the Galaxy Note 3, but in order to get that feature to activate, you needed to use the pen. So the pen is no longer needed. This was called pen window, and you would have to make a ridiculous box on the display of some size, and it would make a window that was either large or small so that you could have your application running within this window. So just say I wanted to activate the calculator. Well, there you have it. You've got that calculator. So this is a great feature and all, but if you need to use the S Pen to get that feature to work, that's not so great. The feature becomes kind of a moot point, and I didn't really use it because of that. I found that I did like the S Pen, and I would use the S Pen here and there, but I did not want to be forced to use the S Pen to have a feature that is as useful as this handy to me. So Samsung said, okay, okay, we will make this available. So now there are some things I'm actually using. I'm actually using the ability to have that small window. It now also includes the ability to use things at the bottom here, home button, your recent tasks and your back button. And you can finally use this without having to use the S Pen. So just these small changes have made this device so much more enjoyable to use. Another thing that you are able to do within this window that I find quite nifty is just say that you're browsing the web or whatever and you want to include some of the text inside of a text message. You can click this little button here and then it allows you to drag and drop text. So you can see that this is essentially what you were able to do. So we've got blah blah, all this stuff here, and you can see it actually puts blah blah. Then you have the option to make it larger if you'd like, or you can simply just close it outward. Then of course we've got the S Pen features, which you can click this button and activate. We've got Action Memo, Smart Select, Image Clip, and Screen Write. I don't want to get too much into these. I will really get into these in my full review. With Action Memo, this is the same thing as on the Galaxy Note 3. So this is something that should be very familiar to you. Hello! Let's recognize it and search for it on the web. Hello! Goodbye. We've got Smart Select, which I really have not figured out how to master just yet, but you're just supposed to just pick something in a window, and you can collect these things, so it'll put it in a little box up here. You can just normally go through the interface, it'll stay, and if you find something else that you want to add, the blah blah thing. You can go ahead and collect that as well. And then when you are satisfied with all of your little collections, you can save it to scrapbook. Or you can share it. And you've also got more options where you can select these and delete them. So I will see how useful that actually ends up being. You've also got image clip, so you can click on this and you can highlight any area with a lasso and you can edit it, save it to scrapbook, yada yada. Then lastly, you've got screen write, which just takes a screen capture of the entire display, and you can write on that, and also save it to scrapbook. So you've got some nice pen features. I really don't know when I would use these. I'm sure once in a while. The one that I end up using once in a while is actually the action memo, if I'm trying to write down a phone number or something. So I find this one to be the most useful, and that already existed on the Note 3. The other ones I'm still debating. 
Another thing that I like that's quite functional is that now when you hold down this task switcher button or recent applications button, you can see you're presented with this little icon that means that you can have a split screen view. So just say that I want to have Google Music open. I can also pick from one of these other applications so I can be scrolling through my music or doing whatever with my music and I can write a Gmail or I can go into Hangouts or I can sit and look for a YouTube video. So this is kind of a way to activate the multi-window and then of course if you hold down on the back button you can activate this multi-window thing as well. So I see that they just give you more options here to be able to use more applications. They try to make multitasking an easier thing to do. Now let's talk about that fingerprint scanner. This is something we first saw on the Galaxy Note 5. And this was a feature I thought was pretty nice, especially coming from the iPhone 5S. But I always had mixed feelings about it because it wasn't as easy to use, in my opinion, than on the iPhones. Because for the iPhones, you simply just need to rest your finger and it will unlock the display. Whereas on Samsung's rendition, you have to move your finger downward across it. And that swiping motion I find to give a higher degree of error, something that requires a bit more practice. And for someone who has small hands, this feature is very difficult to use one-handed because Samsung requires you to swipe your entire pad over it. So I notice that you have to be very slow. And also, that's another thing that I'm seeing happening a lot, is you can't have any moisture on your fingers because then it complains that you need to wipe off that button. Yes, considered I do have quite oily fingers. So this is not the best design for me. You can see I have to go very slow and then it will open. So I noticed several times I'll be struggling with this thing, trying to get it to work. Aha, it works, behold. When I actually don't care to show it working, it works. Let's do that again, let's do that again. No match, no match, no, oh, okay, cool. All right then. But anyway, this just adds to my point of the iffiness of the situation. I find that it works best if I'm very slow and deliberate then it should work each time. But if I want to get kind of snappy with it, it's really give or take. You can't do it quickly. No match, it complains. I am happy to see that we do have an extra setting in here now. You can use any of your fingerprints. You can register three. I can't, you know what? I don't have the ability to actually do this. Okay, three. You have the ability to register three fingerprints. It's really weird. Maybe you guys should try this. I can do this three with one hand on the left hand, my not dominant hand, but I really can't do that with the other hand. You can see how my fingers get all contorted. I can do this. This is what I do. So three. Yes. So three fingerprints. Sorry for that random tangent. You can now use any of those three fingerprints to sign in to a web page. So I find that to be quite nice. I have not used this yet. This will be definitely something to look at for the full review, but it's possible. And then screen lock where you can use a designated fingerprint to unlock anything that requires a password on the phone, such as hiding a document. And that mode I'm talking about is private mode. So you can also use your finger for private mode to hide certain documents. And then you've got the Samsung account and PayPal. So let's talk a little bit about this display, shall we? We have a 5.7 inch display on both of these devices. This is 386 pixels per inch versus the 515 pixels per inch. That's crazy. We are really getting up there with these quad HD displays. I do have to say that with Samsung AMOLED panels, since they do have that diamond matrix pen tile, it's really nice to have a very high resolution because then you can't really tell anymore that it's pen tile, that it's missing a sub-pixel per pixel, basically. So it looks really nice and sharp. It's not as sharp as the G906S. The G906S had 577 pixels per inch versus 517. And that was also a 5.1 inch display. The G906S is the Galaxy S5 that has the LTE Advanced. That was the Korean only model. I actually have a video, you can check out the link in the description if you're curious about that device. The LTE Advanced version of the Galaxy S5, but it is sharp enough and I am pleased. I am a person who is quite sensitive to that pen tile matrix. So on certain things like along borders, or on text, you can see that there's little tiny black dots. Like you can see where those subpixels are missing. And it's very difficult to make that out now. So it does make a very big difference. 386 boosted to 515 makes a big difference for AMOLED with that diamond matrix pentile. 
Now I do want to complain a little bit about my display. I will probably be exchanging this unit. What I'm noticing is that the display uniformity is not so good. I am talking about whites. It's really noticeable on whites. So if you are browsing the web, this is something that I notice a lot is that you can see that up on this half of the display, it's warmer, it's kind of greenish looking, and then it gets to be a totally different temperature down at the bottom. It's bluish and it just looks weird and it annoys me when I am browsing the web and I am reading the top of the page, I get down to the page and it's a different temperature. Now this is something that's so common with AMOLED displays. Usually I am unlucky enough to get one like this at first. Sometimes I get a good one, but mostly I end up exchanging it. That's what I did with the Galaxy Note 3. The display looked terrible. I exchanged it and this one actually has nice uniformity now. So that's something that's very, very common. I don't know if a lot of people notice this, but I do have others saying, oh no, my Note 4, the display looks kind of two-toned. Well, yeah, that, that's right, it, it pretty much is. I don't know how much you can tell on camera here, but it's there. So if you notice that on your device, it's very common. If you exchange it, you have a good chance of getting one that's just the same or one that's better. I would probably take the risk because it's annoying enough to me. Rant over. So let's get into talking a little bit about the calibration, especially because a lot of people are asking me about this basic mode because it's being said to be the best calibrated display. It's so accurate to sRGB. I'm going to get into that, but first I want to talk a little bit about these modes. So first is adaptive display, and this is the mode that comes standard out of the box. This is the default. So it says adaptive display. This mode automatically optimizes the color range, saturation, and sharpness of your display for the following applications, gallery, camera, internet, video, smart remote, Google Playbooks, and then of course, note, this mode may not be compatible with third-party applications. Great, because I don't like what it does anyway. I don't want this mode fiddling with my image. And then we have the AMOLED Cinema mode. So this AMOLED Cinema mode is just the crazy mode, I call it. It's got super oversaturated colors, and then Samsung does this crazy thing with the gamma, where they boost gamma really high in shadows, and then they make this S-curved thing that does this steep decline towards highlights. It makes it look really contrasty, so it really pops. It's very saturated, it pops, but it's not any sort of accurate, and by now everyone knows that, no one is wanting to use this as a accurate mode, it's to give an effect. Also, I noticed that the color temperature is quite bluish for this mode. So when you look at whites, they're too bluish. So you can remedy that, the bluish whites, by going down to AMOLED Photo. AMOLED Photo keeps that saturation, but the gamma is more sane, so it doesn't have that crazy S-curve. And also, the color temperature is more neutral. It's more warm. It's at 6,500K-ish, which is good. But I noticed that the white balance is not perfect. It's got a little bit too much green still. But still, I prefer this mode much more over the AMOLED Cinema because the whites don't look as bluish. Then you've got the basic mode. And basic mode is for watching content. So I can say right off the bat, if you were wanting to watch Netflix, just say that you're watching weeds on Netflix and skin tones look really pinkish or reddish or oversaturated. If you go down to the basic mode, skin tones look monumentally better. So this is the mode that I use when watching content. Now to talk of the calibration accuracy to sRGB, it's not accurate. For sRGB, we should have gamma along the 2.2 line, although technically the sRGB standard, the gamma is a curve. Anyway, 2.2 line, and this does not meet that 2.2 line. The gamma is actually too high. And when you have higher gamma, not only does that darken the image, but it also saturates the image as well. So when I did measurements, it's over 2.2. It's like 2.4 going into 2.5 at points. It's not the right gamma for sRGB. And if you want to know, if you go over to DisplayMate, you look at his measurements as well, and he does say that the gamma is too high. You can have color accuracy all you want, but if the gamma is wrong, the gamma affects how those colors look. So the best way I can put it is that if you have a red and you boost the gamma on the red, the red will get darker and more saturated. So it's not the same color as it was before you boosted that gamma. So it's, it's not where the gamma should be. It's not sRGB standard, but it does look good for certain content. I, I agree. So that is really all there is to say about that. So most sane colors, but not sRGB. 
very insane colors, but at least the whites are okay. And then cinema mode, everything goes to hell. That's, that's all I can say about the cinema mode. Interesting. Very interesting mode. So there you have it. Now, as for performance, I really don't want to say much about it. I am still playing around with it, but what I can say is that frame rates in games are good. Even though we have a display that is really, really insane resolution, I think this device does great. And in comparison to the LG G3, with a little bit of benchmarks I've done so far using GameBench, the frame rates are better. So we have the S805 here. The SoC is the S805. We've got 2.7 gigahertz, four core CPU and the Adreno 420 GPU. So with the S805 and a Quad HD display, it does better than the LG G3 that has the S801. No surprise there. Woo! So I will get more into this. I will do some comparisons and such in the full review. But I am very satisfied so far. So lastly, I want to talk just a little bit about the camera. I will be covering this a lot more in the full review. There's just a couple of things I want to say so far. I am very happy that it's got optical image stabilization so that it really helps pictures. It really helps this device out because on the Galaxy Note 3, unfortunately, I noticed that when I was taking pictures indoors, a lot of the times they came out blurry. It was very difficult for me to hold the device stable and to take a picture and for it to not come out blurry. That's something that a lot of people were seeing with the Galaxy Note 3. So that optical image stabilization really helps with taking nice and sharp indoor pictures and also helps in low lighting as well. But where I have been most curious about the optical image stabilization has been in video because I don't find it to be the best quality optical image stabilization, unfortunately. The optical image stabilization in video is kind of jittery. You will see that the optical image stabilization kind of has a jittery type of effect to it. That's unfortunate. You also have another mode that you can use in video, which confused me at first. You can see that we have video size and then video stabilization mode. So for 720p and 1080p video, you have the option to turn on this electronic image stabilization as well. So it's a digital image stabilization. And so what it does is it crops the image and it adds this extra stabilization to it that's digital post-processing. Unfortunately, it's horrible. So don't get yourself confused and be underneath 1080p video and end up using the video stabilization mode because it does crop your image and it's terribly wobbly. So your image looks a little bit cropped and wobbly as well. So I would just keep this mode off at all costs. It's bad. I can't say whether it has optical image stabilization and then also the electronic image stabilization enabled at the same time. That's something I'm trying to discover. But I know that you are turning on the electronic stabilization and it just looks, it's so bad. It looks really bad. And now it looks like it's standing still. Not exactly sure what's going on with that.
So I will continue on using this camera. I will do some lighting tests and all of that good stuff and plenty of video tests. And I've also got several phones to compare the stabilization to. So we will get into all of that in the full review. So this is all that I want to say about this phone so far. And I'm liking it. I am really liking it, although I am not convinced about that optical image stabilization. But the factor that really convinces me when going to look for a phone is the battery life. And this phone does pretty good with that. Plus, it's a large phone, and I like large phones, and it's got features for me to be able to use it. So good battery life and being able to use it one-handed is what makes a phone of this size worth it to me. I'm going to reserve my final opinions for a little bit later, but yes, I am liking it so far. I am liking it better than the Note 3. And in my opinion so far, I think it is a worthy upgrade to the Note 3. That display is just so much sharper. And the look and feel of it is just very premium. If you've ever felt bad about having a plasticky Samsung device, this changes the game entirely. So thank you everybody for watching. This has been Erica, the technology nerd who likes to film stuff. Please rate, comment, and subscribe. Ask your questions in the comment section below so that I can look into those for the full review. I'm going to use this for another week, another two weeks or so. I don't want to give an expected time of arrival for the review, but I do want to use this a little bit more because you start seeing some things come out that you don't notice in the first week. So it's not appropriate to make a full review, but that's what this video is for, just in case you want to see some stuff on the surface. So thank you everyone for watching. It is very late. You can see that I'm crazy. It's 2.19 a.m. What what's wrong with me? I'm gonna go to bed now. Thank you everyone, good night.